All right. Well, hello, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be here with uh, my friend George Dyson. Uh, George, as some of you might know, is um, a very acclaimed historian of science, a writer on science and technology, historian of technology, who has written a lot of wonderful books. Uh, the two that I always recommend are Turing's Cathedral and Darwin Among the Machines. And uh, you know, I always tell people, if you want to understand the current wave of AI, uh, it's it's these books are essential reading. They'll give you material that you won't easily find in other books. Um, but among other things, George also wrote a book called uh, Project Orion, which was about uh, what seems like a harebrained idea about a spaceship that was powered by falling and exploding nuclear bombs. And one of the main protagonists, if not the main protagonist in that story was George's father and uh, uh, my uh, dear late beloved um, mentor and friend, Freeman Dyson. And I'm sure I uh, certainly don't have to uh, mention to everyone who is watching uh, this video, uh, Freeman was one of the most acclaimed, one of the most well-known scientific minds of the 20th century. Um, he was enormously impactful as a mathematician, theoretical physicist, um, worked very closely with uh, some very famous names uh, in theoretical physics, of which he was one, obviously, but he worked with Richard Feynman, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, a host of other people who are well known to, to those who know the history of physics. Um, but he was also a very rare individual in that he straddled very well what C.P. Snow had once called the two cultures. So the culture of hard science and technology and the culture of humanism and social sciences. And I think he, he was one of the very few people I know who could who could do that exceedingly well in, in both those domains. And the result of straddling those two cultures was a, a whole series of uh, amazing books of essays and speeches and book reviews that came out in the last 20, 30 years where he really showcases how deeply he understood human problems as well as uh, technological and scientific problems. And, uh, you know, clearly we need more people like that. Um, but but he wrote, uh, how, how many books did Freeman write in, in total? A dozen? It depends how you count. I mean, right. do you count collections of book reviews that were then published as a book? I would probably a... count those as well. But if, if you just count things that were in hardcover volumes, it's it's at least 13, including his, 13. his first book, which was a sort of lecture volume of, of group theory and physics. Oh, yeah. That, that was before the autobiography. Yeah. 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 So we are here to commemorate George and I, we are here to commemorate what would have been uh, Freeman's 100th birthday. Um, and, and he died in February 2020. He was born on December 15th, uh, 1923. Um, you know, almost almost saw the centenary, but uh, nonetheless lived a very long and very, very productive life. And uh, many of us were fortunate to be his friends and colleagues and, and part of his family. He had a, a huge influence, uh, both direct and indirect on many of us. So we, we thought that this would be a great opportunity to sort of celebrate his life and talk about, uh, you know, some of his teachings that that we learned from him and uh, what we thought he really gave the world. And so just, just to kind of set the stage, George, um, you know, I thought that we could start by talking about the year in which he was born. And, uh, you know, for I'm sure for some people, it would feel like it was ancient history because uh, the world in some ways was very different back then. Um, but I thought, you know, what what I would do is um, look up some of the things that happened in 1923 and some of the other people who were born uh, in 1923. Um, and um, uh, I think I think, you know, from a from a scientific standpoint, one thing that I realized when I was thinking about 1923, and this would be astonishing to someone today, especially a young scientist or a young person, quantum mechanics had not been invented in 1923 and today it seems like it, it would be impossible that such and such a time existed but of course you know heisenberg first thought about what, what he called matrix mechanics in 1925 and then the uncertainty principle and then schrodinger and but i mean that kind of tells you you know some people might think that that would be a good sort of um you know it, it's a good guide for understanding what 1923 really was um, but is, is there something else that strikes you about that year that Freeman used to talk about? Well, it, it just it was this interim 
period. I mean, the, the two define or the real defining landmarks were that, of course, Freeman grew up in Britain and World War One was over. That had been a just an unfathomable tragedy and, and a, you know, entire generation lost. And yet, even by 1923, it was clear that the that the problems had not been solved, and and so very quickly, of course, as Freeman was a child, in, in the so you know 1930, he's six or seven years old, and it's clear that the next war is is approaching. So they had barely sort of got out of one war and were facing the next, and that that to me, I th that's what I always understood was sort of the defining sort of frame of his childhood with uh, science as, as sort of the, both the, the threat, you know, what, what would science bring for the next war in terms mm -hmm. of more terrible weapon? World War One had been brutal and World War II would clearly be worse, but then also science, you know, off, offered hope. So, it's interesting you mentioned C.P. Snow because he 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 sort of uh, put Freeman on the path in life that he mm -hmm. he, he faced this at age eighteen he 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 got to go to college but the deal was you only got eighteen months of college and then you had to join the war effort and the mm -hmm. guy the gatekeeper who decided how you joined the war effort was C.P. Snow who was working as a bureaucrat and. And it was C.P. Snow who, they, everyone thought Freeman would go to Bletchley Park to do code breaking, which by then I think was sort of stale and, and become just a, also a big bureaucracy. And he said, no, he wanted to, you know, go where the, where there was closer to the action. So he, it was C.P. Snow who got him into Bomber Command, which also right. really defined Freeman. I think if Freeman had gone to Bletchley Park, he would have turned out to be a very different person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's funny you mentioned that because now I'm remembering in one of his interviews, he says that he was interviewed by C.P. Snow, who painted this picture of what it was going to be like working at Bomber Command. That was an unvarnished lie. <laughs> so he he painted this extremely romanticized picture of Freeman flying with the pilots uh, in the formations. <laughs> and totally, I mean, he seems to have been a great salesman as well as a great writer, C.P. Snow. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll certainly talk about Freeman's experience in, in World War II, but um, another thing that I recognized about 1923, 20, I was also trying to look at the major scientific and technological discoveries then, and um, uh, th there was one science discovery that stood out and then one technology discovery that stood out, and I think Freeman uh, would have appreciated both of them. One was the discovery of the Compton effect which showed that um, you know electrons and photons are waves and, and, and I mean waves are particles effectively. And then in the same year, uh, Louis de Broglie, who was the French physicist, he came out with this little equation that showed that particles are waves. So in the same year, one, one person showed that waves are particles and the other person showed that particles are waves. So that was interesting. Um, but the other big discovery that was kind of a sleeper discovery, and, and I think some Freeman especially would have appreciated it, was the discovery of the ultra centrifuge. Uh, and I didn't know that that was developed in 1923. And you probably know that the ultra centrifuge was absolutely foundational in the molecular biology revolution because it could separate out all the components, the molecular components of, of biological systems, uh, nucleic acids and proteins and so on. And you know that took me back to a lot of what Freeman used to say about tools being more important than ideas in science, which is still not something that people always appreciate. Yeah, or they come first. You have to have. Or they come first, and and then they enable people to discover new ideas. Obviously, so, um, so you know the time that Freeman was born. I mean, it, it's. I think it was. I think even later, as as you rightly said, the World War One was what was the unmitigated tragedy for. Uh, for England, even more so than World War II in, in some sense. Uh, uh, and clearly it was recognized back then, you know, a couple of months back, I got a copy of the first edition of John Maynard Keynes's book. Uh, it's titled The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he talks about the Treaty of Versailles and how 
unjust and unfair he was. And he doesn't mince any words. He says, this is going to be a complete disaster, the, the way Germany is being treated. Um, and, um, and, and along those lines, what's also interesting is that 1923 was when Hitler led the Beer Hall Putsch. And he was arrested for that. So it's it was all. I mean, in retrospect, you can see it unfolding like a Greek tragedy. But uh, but even back then, some people like Keynes were acutely aware of of what was happening. Clearly, so, um, so you know, let's talk a bit about Freeman's parents because they obviously had a uh, your grandparents who had a very formative influence on him. Um, so his his father was Sir George Dyson, and uh, you were named after him. Um, and uh, his mother was was Mildred. That's, that's right. And and tell me a little bit about her because I think more people have heard about Sir George and his compositions, and he was a, a great musician. But your grandmother was very progressive for for her times, isn't that true? Yeah, she was very very progressive. She was sort of strong feminist, and and uh, and actually was a lawyer. It was. You, what you call a solicitor so that i mean their whole life was a product of world war one and and that of course freeman was was directly a result of world war one because his uh mildred's uh brother was was freeman hmm. and who was best friends with with George, with the my my grandfather George, and they they the day World War One was declared, they enlisted together and and joined the war, and then and then Freeman was killed in August uh, nineteen sixteen by a sniper, and so George had the sort of unhappy job of of bringing the news to mildred that that, that mm -hmm. you know he had survived and her brother had been lost and they in their one way or another they uh you know be, being companions in grief and whatever they they got married and they had two children the first child alice mm -hmm. and then they had a boy who of course they named freeman after the uncle who who was killed in the war so so freeman always you know, so well, we, the war was terrible, but he wouldn't be there without the war. Right, so, right, yeah, Un unforeseen consequence of it. And so Mildred, of course, was was being a lawyer. She had a way with words. I think, I think Freeman had sort of a literary mm. bent. It, it it came from her. She was, and and again, that was an accident that would not have happened without the war, because the the young men, all all the young men who normally were clerks in the law office, were joined the war so there were openings for for young women who, which ah. otherwise would not be the case the same happened in science that's how you know mm. war brought a lot of women into science and so sh she got to be a law clerk and liked it and took her exams and became a lawyer but never actually practiced as a lawyer so spent most of her life in social work actually helping mm. helping other young women and so she was a very strong character and was 41 years old when when freeman was born so that was quite for that time that was that was very quite late. Old. yeah you know, so freeman was raised by by these very sort of intellectually advanced parents who so that that exposed him to the what you what you just talked about the, the sort of this amazing flourishing of physics in the late 1920s was was sort of you know dinner table conversation because the Freeman's father, in particular, had a, had a strong sort of civilian interest in in following these advances in science. Yeah, and I think that made a big difference because even even though he wasn't a scientist, he used to bring home a lot of books by people like Arthur Eddington. I remember Freeman especially mentioning Edit Eddington quite a bit. And you know, just the other day, I picked a, a book by Eddington, and it's I mean, it's it it sounds appears as fresh as as it did in the 1920s. I mean, the writing is still that good. So I can imagine that books like that must have had an impact on Freeman. Yes. Yeah. And of course, he started devouring books at you know the age of six or whatever he was reading. Yeah. Was there, I mean, I'm I'm assuming at, at that point, was it fairly common to go to public libraries and, and get books the way we do in the United States? Or did people buy books? I 
that's an interesting question. All these questions I would like to ask Freeman. I don't. He never talked about um, public libraries. Although his his father was on the was a trustee of the Carnegie Trust, which was building libraries. So there certainly was a strong interest in them. But, but you know, young Freeman probably had a you know he had a very privileged position because his father was a teacher, so he probably had access to the. Of course, in in London, I mean, he talks about his childhood, the, the part that he was in London. He he would just go to the British Museum. I mean, it was right, it was right there. And, and he complained when he went to the private school, Twyford. He, uh, you know, there sort of the library was his refuge. It was he he he, you know, he always claimed he really learned nothing except what he got out of the library. Hmm. So at that young age, he was he was largely self-taught, and and he learned learned a lot from books. Clearly, pretty much he was, yeah. um, you know, he was eight when he was sent to the private school. One of the things that turned up in his you know, papers I went through was a letter from a woman in in France. I wish I'd had this at the time. So it was 1987, and. So Freeman has just published his, you know, enough books that people are able to find him. And she, she said, I read about you in a French magazine. I'd like to know if you are the young Freeman Dyson, age seven years old. I saw twice in Winchester, who was Keith Ross's friend. Hmm. At time, I was the French girl au pair in the Ross family. I remember quite well and will never forget the extremely clever eyes of the young Freeman Dyson who spoke to me of trigonometry. <laughs> I can say that I was quite dazzled and thought this boy will be a famous man in life. Oh, that's great. I'm sure Freeman must have been delighted to get that letter. <laughs> yeah. So, you, so Freeman you, must have been what, eight, eight or 10? when Seven. 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 <laughs> seven he's, he, you know, he meets the, the older French au pair who I think I, I, I looked her up. She had also a very interesting life. And, so I think she would have been eight, eight, 17 or 18 at the time. Right. And, and then uh, trigonometry at, at seven is definitely quite, quite precocious. <laughs> so, but I think he, I think he, he learned that it, that it, uh, you know, it charmed the women. I mean, which, which is... <laughs> so, yeah, he, he had, he had the, the kind of sort of reputation that nerds nerds have today, I suppose. So he told, so, he told me that he he almost never gave me personal advice, but he he did. You know, he never gave me the normal fatherly. This is how you date girls or anything like that. But he he did one time tell me that you 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 don't have to be attractive. You just have to be smart. <laughs> yes, smart is the new new attractive certainly. Um, so he went to Twyford, and then of course he um, he got got into Winchester College, which was this very prestigious institution, and um, that was, I mean, I'm assuming that for bright bright young boys, that was a, a favorite destination uh, before they went off to what we call college, right? So it was uh, it was what we would call middle and high school. Is that right? Yes, I mean it was. You know what in America we would sort of call prep school. That you, mm. and, and these schools were very um, quite specific. That that w Winchester was. If I don't, if I have this right, maybe I have it wrong. I mean, one of one of the famous schools was a direct line to Oxford, and one was a direct line to Cambridge. And I think ah, so just like a prep school here, right? Um, and for instance, the the current, you know, Prime Minister of England went went to Winchester. It really was it was a very exclusive place. But but Winchester prided itself in being more academically rigorous than the other. Um, Eton, I think, is the other the other one. So Eton and Winchester, right, right. Eaton. And uh, and what's interesting is that among other people, and that show, shows you the diversity of people who went to Winchester. So G.H. Hardy, the famous mathematician who later taught Freeman at Cambridge, he went to Winchester. Mm -hmm. And then I believe Rishi Sunak, who is the current prime minister of England, went to Winchester as well. So make of that what you will regarding the diversity of people who came uh, out, of, out of Winchester. Um, 
And Eton was, you know, now, I mean, Eton was the more politically oriented school, right? Didn't a lot of prime ministers and, you know, ministers come out of Eton? Um, yeah, it's a, it, it's quite, I mean, I visited there, yeah, 2009. And, and of course, it was strictly male. There were no, no females. Which is, but when when Freeman and I visited there together in two thousand nine, there was a we were actually invited by a um, the math teacher there who who was a woman and oh. and had actually had discovered these polyhedra that Freeman had made before the war and, and they still survived at the school so she wanted me to bring Freeman in to to talk about these things. Hmm. I asked her, I said, isn't, isn't it time, you know, it's 2009, isn't it time to to bring in some girls? And she was very strongly, no, that this, this it would be a distraction. And the, the point was learning. <laughs> Interesting. Even, and that was uh, even in 2009 when you visited. Even though she was, so it, it's, it's a, it's of a different world. And I think that it, it anyway, we, that we should get sidetracked on that. But it's, yeah, yeah. So, you know, one, one interesting coincidence um, about Freeman's time at Winchester is uh, one of his teachers, I believe there was a man named Clement Durell. Yes. Uh, and, you know, he was a physicist, a mathematics and physics teacher. And um, um, he wrote this very clear elementary book on relativity called Readable Relativity. Um, and so I remember Freeman mentioning that book, maybe in an interview or in one of his books. And so I ordered a copy. And it turned out that that copy belonged to Sam Schweber, who later did this long series of interviews. And and you find this when you when you order these used books on the history of physics or 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 mathematics, you you find that there's a fairly small group of people uh, among whom these books uh, circulate. And so they usually you know you you can recognize the owners uh, an unusual number of times. But um, um, so Winchester was where Freeman sort of really came on his own and he, and he truly flowered and um, he did very well there because I, you know, obviously uh, there's this story about how he used to win uh, the, the class prize every year and would buy a book of his choice uh, with the money that he got from it. Yes. I mean, and he, 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 Freeman was extremely lucky all through life, just, miraculous things happened to him and, and the, the thing that happened at Winchester that that really made all the difference I think I think otherwise if we heard about Winchester it would have been a, a sort of dark unhappy time in his life but but he happened to enter Winchester at the same time as as uh, the Langerie Higgin brothers the Two brothers and and um, now I'm like uh, Christopher and Michael, right? Yeah, Christopher and Michael, and then and then his other his best friend, whose name I forget right now. But anyway, so they, 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 these four they all became FRS very young, and they just formed a gang and spent all their time together and taught each other mathematics. They didn't have it. There were no professors there who could teach them that they advanced in mathematics sort of in the first year beyond what anyone could teach. And they, they were allowed to sort of do this on their own. And, and without that social group, um, it, it, it would have been very, very different. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It it reinforces what we already know about college, which is the main purpose is in college yeah. to le learn from your peers, not from your professors. That's yeah. huge. It's it's social life. Yeah. The... Yeah, James Lytle was the other. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, Christopher Longe Higgins. He was a chemist first time, mean, but he was also a kind of a polymath, right? He he went into neuroscience later. And one connection that a lot of people today don't know is um, um, Jeffrey Hinton, who is the big AI expert, was a student of Christopher Longe Higgins. So a lot of people don't realize that, but that's kind of an indirect connection to Freeman there. Um, yeah, and, J and, and Lighthill wrote a very 
famous but forgotten report on AI in, in 1970. Oh, really? In 1975, the British government decided we, we'd better do something, just like now, we'd better do something about AI. And and so let's commission, uh, you know, have a royal commission. And the job was given to uh, Whitehill to sort of survey the world about whether AI would, would make any difference or not. Oh, and interesting. <laughs> it's worth rereading that report. It was, it was quite prophetic. I mean, sort of said, yes, but it's, Got yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, another thing that uh, I remember about Freeman's time as at Winchester is he checked out this book of analysis, mathematical analysis, and it it seemed like it was hidden in the library by someone, and he thinks it was G. H. Hardy, and it was hidden to be found by people like Freeman, um, and and you know that was, I mean, among the more interesting parts of his time at, at Winchester, he seems to have been very impressed with this book. I think he certainly cited it as one of the more influential books. Uh, it was by this French mathematician whose name I can't remember. Oh, Jordan. Jordan, I think that that was. Yeah, it's the Cour d'Analyse. Yeah, when we right, actually, right, yeah. when we were there looking at the polyhedra, we went to the library and it was still there in the same place on the shelf. Same place. <laughs> yeah, someone else needs to discover it now. So I, I've got beautiful photographs of Freeman just grinning ear to ear because he's, re, you know, he, he's got the same book. And, and at that so, time, this book was a treasure. And, yeah, yeah. So the polyhedra that Freeman and his friends built, they are still there. As... They're still there. And they, <laughs> they had like... lost the genealogy. Nobody knew what oh. the story was, but they had been kept. And, and there they all were in a glass case. They're absolutely... oh, that, that must have been a great, wonderful surprise for Freeman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's also just, uh, and they're so beautiful. I mean, they're, they're perfect. Yeah, yeah. So Winchester... Um, when does he when does he finish Winchester? Is that before the war starts or the war is starting and he so 40, 1940? Yeah, he 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 sort of is held back a year. He he and uh Lighthill decide to you know that they're they've had enough of Winchester, let's go to Cambridge. And so they go there on their own on the train and take the exam. Everything there then, I mean, it's it's unfathomable to <laughs> to me as an American how how sort of there were rules, but you could break them. And so I guess there was no rule against going up to Cambridge and taking the exam. So they did at, at age fifteen, I guess. It's, it's it, you know, I, it's all in the biography I, I wrote for the Royal Society, but I don't mm -hmm. I'm ready for getting the dates. But, but so they go up to Cambridge and take the exam and they both get in. But someone says, well, you, you, you're in, but we think it would be better for you to wait a year, you know, maybe grow up a little bit before yeah. you, <laughs> before you. No, so so they're in. I think, and I think that gave them uh, probably their finest year at Winchester because they, you know, they normally, knew where they were going. <laughs> yeah, normally, you're in a panic. What school I got to get into? Right, what right. I going to do with my life? They they knew they were they were going to <laughs> Trinity College. Um, they could do whatever they want that year, and I think the also the teachers left them alone. I mean, again, even even by then, the younger teachers were joining the war, and and uh, so. So yeah, then they go to Cambridge the next year, right? And so they get there, and of course, it's it's a very special time because a lot of the professors have left for war-related work. I'm assuming, and so there's uh, uh, the workload at Cambridge is quite light. They don't have, there's there's not a lot of classes. It's just a few hours every week. Yes, it's it's this accident, again accident of history in Freeman's yeah. face. But you, you get there, and of course, of course, the two wonderful things have happened. The the older students have all left to join the war and the younger professors have all left. So you're left with these very young students and the old distinguished professors. So, so Freeman, you know, takes physics from Dirac. He, he takes uh, yep. Fourier analysis from, uh, I mean, from, all, from Hardy, right? Yeah. Hardy, yeah. With, with four people in the class and, and uh, one of whom was a woman who who, who becomes an astronomer. 
So so everything was open to, he has one class, and of course, um, he has one class where the he's the only student, and he wonders whether the professor would still give the lecture. You know, and he does. Empty, empty room. <laughs> so to have so access, this, this kind of access to... Just, uh, just a stroke of good luck, like you said. I mean, yeah, so, you know, these days, as you know, students are always, when they're applying to colleges, they're always looking at places with very low uh, teachers to, to teacher to student ratio. And so this must have been one of the lowest ratios that anyone encountered uh, at a place like Cambridge, especially. So, yeah, yeah, okay. no, it's, it's uh... okay. Yeah. So he, he took relativity from Eddington. With oh, right. Two, yeah. <laughs> two other students. <laughs> and fluid dynamics from Harold Jeffries alone. So, yeah, interesting. Well, I suppose Eddington probably refrained from war work because he was a Quaker, right? Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, probably. But, uh, and then there's, of course, the, you know, this is something other people have recounted in Dirac's lectures. He, he used to just read from his book because he thought that it had been said so per perfectly in his book that he didn't have to explain it any further. And when someone asked him to repeat a point, he said, well, just read the book. <laughs> so at, at some point. Um, and so um, this was, and so how long was he at Cambridge? I mean, obviously college, it wasn't the customary three years or four years that we have now. No, it was really 18 months. Just 18 months, effectively. Yeah, very quick. And, and... And then, and also no, you know, if, if it's interesting that it, how sort of facts and memories differ, because if you asked Freeman, I mean, the big thing at Trinity Cambridge was the, the tripos exam, the, that yes. was the, the competitive exam. And, and Freeman always prided himself in being non-competitive. Mm -hmm. And and I don't I can't remember exact asking him point blank, but my understanding always was that he he never paid any attention to the the tripos. He wasn't an exam person. In fact, he 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 writes how he you know they were there were no exams. It was wartime. But but when I did the research for the Royal Society and really dug into the details, he did take the tripos and was actually very excited to it. He did very well at it, and. So he was preparing for exams, even though he said it was wartime and nobody was doing it. But, but likewise, they they let him skip the I think the first two parts, and he could he could just start with the hard part. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, Freeman always seemed like someone who did things for fun, and and he had the capacity to do that. So just like he didn't he didn't care about getting a PhD later. You know, I'm you know he didn't seem to have cared too much about these official examinations and and you know other other things uh, that were required of, of, of students so um so at the end of his time in cambridge of course he is recruited by cp snow for bomber command and one interesting um sideline there is his philosophy of of um of pacifism so he was you know he was a pretty dedicated pacifist uh as as a as as a teenager and as you know, was heavily influenced by Gandhi. He was also influenced by Aldous Huxley, who wrote this book called Ends and Means, which I think is one of part of the list of books that he bought. But in Disturbing the Universe, his memoirs, he talks about how it became increasingly hard for him to defend a completely pacifist viewpoint in the face of Hitler. And so he started making exceptions for, okay, you, you can be a pacifist, except in these circumstances. And then so sort of started loosening those constraints on pacifism. And uh, I'm sure that must not have been an easy psychological evolution for him um, when it when it came time to commit himself to to uh, you know participating in, in war-related research. Did he did he talk about that evolution? He he did. He wrote, you know, I have all his letters to my mother. There's actually it's, it's 1818 pages of handwritten letters back oh, and forth. Wow. And so when they when they first, many more than in the published volume. <laughs> yeah, when, they, when they first meet, well, the no, these are these have never been. I mean, these are very private and have never sure, been right, right, 
opened up, but but I'm I'm slowly getting them transcribed. And but the but so when he met my mother, there there which also surprised me. I thought they immediately sort of had a physical relationship, which was sort of the way my mother was. But they apparently not. They had they had a very sort of long distance correspondence for about a year and that's so that's very rich there so in that in in that correspondence he explains to my mother his, his what you just talked about how sort of th this fall from pacifism and he actually had founded a religion he believed he, at one point he he decided to found a religion it was called cosmic unity that we're all <laughs> You know, we're all the same being, and therefore, how can you have wars and stuff? And, and th yeah, that ended. Um, but he, you know, you just have to imagine the social pressure at the time. I mean, all the other young uh, boys, and they were boys, were going off to, the, you know, and at Bomber Command, I mean, the average age was, was 17 or 18. He was, he was older because he had, he had, been in school for 18 months already and and the survival rate was i think he's still i think his whole life he carried this guilt it was a sort of survivor's guilt of, mm -hmm. was, because the problem was he knew he, his job was to be a statistician so he had access to the facts that the 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 boys flying the missions were given all this propaganda and didn't know he knew how bad their chances really were the the odds were, you know, one, your odds were 5% on every mission of not coming mm. back. So if you flew 20 missions, you were statistically dead. Right. And yet the government policy was you flew 30 missions. That was, if you flew 30 missions, you, you could stop being, being sent into combat over Germany. Mm. But statistically, you were long dead before before. Right, you right, yeah. It was almost guarantee that that you didn't stand a chance. And it, so all these things had very interesting. Again, for for Freeman as a mathematician, it, it was just rich with because the, the 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 sort of folk tales they were being given was that well, if you if you made it past twelve missions, or whatever, you were you were okay, you know, because they would point to a few. We were a few guys who had flown 50 missions and were still flying, but the it's always going to be outliers. Yeah, to a statistician, <laughs> that doesn't mean yeah, anything. those are the outliers for a statistician. That's right. right. <laughs> but but it, it, it was absolutely absolutely brutal and and how and how he yeah, so pacifism just could not right stand up to that. Yeah, that. yeah. And just for the people who are watching this, I must note that Freeman has written in great detail about his time at Bomber Command and this set of articles that he wrote for the MIT Technology Review, uh, which is, the the title is, it's very shrewdly titled, A Failure of Intelligence. And I think it's it's a classic, you know, double entendre. I mean, it, it means two very different things, obviously. It, it was a failure of intelligence on the part of bureaucracy, uh, much more than anything else. And I also get the feeling that that experience really entrenched in Freeman an understanding of the stupidity of bureaucracy, and um, and you know the frailty of of people at the top who just don't understand and send these young men to their deaths. Yes, and, and in in writing his memoir for the Royal Society, uh, the family or the person who write, writes gets access one time only to the as a fellow you you're supposed to write an unvarnished autobiography which is locked in the library of the Royal Society and is not open until 70 years after your death. Oh, um, I didn't know that. And yeah, quite remarkable. So you're supposed to, and so he's writing this in 1952. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of cases where the, the scientists are saying vicious things about each other and so on. So it's, it's good to keep anyway, but he does say, and then the, Director gave me permission. I could I could quote this, and so you're supposed to talk about your war service. So he says, "War service." 
I was working for IAF Bomber Command. This was an unsatisfactory assignment since it was generally the policy of the operational research section not to give the command any unpalatable advice. And I was much too young and timid to rebel successfully against this policy. So that... Oh, I see. The, 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 what was the point of, you know, all the all the evidence he gathered of things they were doing wrong never... That's what the failure of intelligence was. That it didn't. Right. It, they gathered the intelligence, but it never. It, it was filtered out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And not to jump ahead, but did he talk about how this experience with bureaucratic stupidity really informed him later in his life when he worked quite a bit with the U.S. government as part of Jason and other consulting arms? Yeah, he's it, also very prophetic. He says, like, a, a, the next. You know, the the cause of the failure of our section to perform its intended function of criticizing objectively the operations of the command was the fact that the leader was a career civil servant, and not a professional scientist of independent standing. I believe it to be a principle of the highest importance that when, when scientific advice is given to executive officers handling affairs of such magnitude as an entire strategic bombing campaign, the advice should be given by a first rate scientist. Ah. Uh. I that is very. <laughs> that is that is yeah. That the Royal Society might profitably concern itself with this problem to keep watch in some way on the important scientific advisory positions in the government and in the armed forces to see that such positions are in the hands of men who know the meaning of scientific uh, objectivity. That is that is extremely prescient. I mean, not just for government, for even for industry, where you know you see this trend of CEOs who are. Who have been scientists or engineers or technical people being replaced by CEOs who are lawyers or or salespeople, and you you just there's a very clear correlation with the decline in performance of of a company when when one is replaced by the other. So that I find that extremely prescient what what you just said. Yeah, that's sort of the, the founding principle behind Jason. I mean, the group that he right, right, yeah, to, to sort of give independent advice. But you know what's also interesting as you were as we are talking about this is his experience with Bomber Command foreshadows some of the experience that the the new the physicists had at Los Alamos, which is that there's this fine line between you know the the, the bureaucracy just wanted the numbers, but they were unwilling to act on the implications of those numbers. And sometimes the scientists themselves understood those implications better. And, you know, that set up this classic conflict between the politicians and the scientists where, you know, even at Los Alamos, the problem was that the politicians had asked the scientists to build a bomb, but they should not have any say in how it's going to be used. And, and but, but that line was not as, as hard and fast because clearly the scientists understood better than the politicians in some sense what the political implications of building the bomb were, uh, but they were prevented from giving that advice. So, you know, we, we know this central dilemma and this reminds me of that. Yeah, no, it was very fundamentally the same. And the other problem that Freeman recognizes is just that if you create such a big machine, I mean, you create Los Alamos, this enormous, and it wasn't just Los Alamos, it was this, all the other laboratories and, and bombing bases and so on to, to do this job, that machine is going, you can't stop it. And the same with, with bomber command. I mean, you set this, set up this in, enormous infrastructure to uh, bomb Germany. It doesn't matter whether it's effective, which was, which was what Freeman's results were. He, he said militarily, he did bomb damage assessment. We're not, we're not shutting down the military production. Mm -hmm. but, it's going to continue, whether that's just just because you can't stop such a large machine. Right, that's right. And and of course, in, in Disturbing the Universe, I, I believe he makes this point by referring to um, um, Edith Nesbitt's book, The Magic City, the children's book, where these machines come to life and then they acquire a life of their own and they, they can't be stopped. So I think he, he got that lesson very early on in his life. So. And he was sued for libel for disturbing the universe was 
Oh, okay. Well, I, I didn't know that part. We could we could talk about that when when we discuss that. I'm I'm there's there's always more more to Freeman than 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 meets the eye, right? That's that's one abiding abiding quality that he had. But so at the end of World War II, now you know he he he's he's very good at mathematics and he thinks he wants to become a mathematician. But there's this story about how he meets this uh, this Indian mathematician Harish Chandra who I think you you were familiar with because he was at the Institute later in Princeton. Yeah. And and he he tells him, well, you know, uh, Harish Chandra tells him I'm, he's a physicist. Harish Chandra was a physicist and he was telling Freeman, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go into mathematics because physics is way too messy and uh, I, you know, I don't like it. And Freeman said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going from mathematics into physics for the exact same reason. I find mathematics too messy, and uh, and that's why you know physics seems more interesting. Um, but in one of his interviews, he also talks about how he set himself the task of solving this very important problem in mathematics, and made that a condition of his going into physics. He said, "If if I could solve that problem, then I'll stay in mathematics. Otherwise, I'll go into physics." Yes, yeah, it was the Minkowski conjecture. He... Hmm. Or, and yeah, he thought if I can do this, I'm I'm a good enough. I'll stay in mathematics. And if any, but he failed. He only sort of proved a special case. And and, and so right, right, yeah. made the decision to to switch to That's physics. Right. Well, fortunately, I mean, he would have been great as a mathematician, but fortunately for the the, the world at large, I think that was a, that was a very good switch. And then he. You know, he's wondering where to go. And this is something that came up in a discussion I had recently. So he wanted to, you know, he started asking around uh, where where he should go for, for graduate school. And he runs into famous physicist G.I. Taylor. And, uh, you know, Taylor tells him, well, the obvious, the obvious answer is Cornell. That is where all the bright people went. But what is interesting, and I'm sure you know this, but I, I, it's, it's very amusing just for those who are watching, is that G.I. Taylor, uh, G. I. Taylor writes him a, a reference letter. And Hans Bethe, uh, who he's applying to, because Bethe is the famous physicist who was head of the theoretical division and mentored Feynman and so on. Taylor speaks very highly of Bethe, so he writes a reference letter for Freeman to Bethe. And the way Beta tells it, and I'm pretty sure this was close to the actual wording, is Taylor said something along the lines of, I have a student here, Dyson, who is not entirely stupid. <laughs> that was the wording in the reference letter that Taylor writes to Hans Beta. And of course, that's the classic British understatement, right? You don't you don't praise anyone very highly. But I thought that was very amusing because as you know, the that is completely opposite to how professors, especially in the US, write reference letters today, where they will say things like, well, this this student is the best that I ever mentored and is among the top 1% of people I have ever known. And this was the exact opposite. But of course, Veda knew what that understatement was. So he appreciated that when someone was being called not entirely stupid, that student must be pretty smart. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so he goes to Beta, And of course, the, the thing that always strikes out you know, sticks out for me is that he says that there were two things I noticed right away, which is that everyone called Hans Beta Hans. They addressed him as Hans, and his shoes were muddy. <laughs> and this must have been a big shock for him, coming from the formal, somewhat stiff academic atmosphere of of Britain. Yes, Cornell was still, or still is, quite rural place. You know, it wasn't London, or it, it really is an agriculture sort of a you know it was really best known for its culinary school at, at that time yeah still is <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i think beta was certainly the man who made the physics department great he, he stayed there for 60 years and and so he goes there and of course his special mathematical skills start coming in handy because there's no one in beta's group who is who is that good at mathematics you know there's some people who know more physics than Freeman does. But uh, I think, uh, you know, talking about good luck, uh, Beta recruits Freeman to work on a problem where his mathematical skills will shine and which would really benefit from all the mathematical training that he had at Cambridge. Yes, again, just 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 with this miraculous luck that he he arrives there right when physics has been just totally 
pushed into disarray because a new experimental result has come in and it makes no sense. Like suddenly everybody's running around trying to resolve this, this thing called a lamb shift, an observation that didn't match the theory. Yeah. So the truth is, I think, just that everybody was very busy. Like nobody had time to take care of this young British graduate student who shows up. What you know? So I think Beta just sort of threw the problem his way. Well, you know, we're kind of trying to do a relativistic version of this. Is that this will keep you out of my hair for six months, and, and you know, and weeks later, of course, it was brings him. The solution <laughs> brings a solution that 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 that's right and that that then that that just made his career that 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 moment more than you know sort of m most stories would go that his real moment was was resolving the Feynman swinger the, the QED problem but I think really this it was this lamb shift calculation that that really got his foot in the door and got him mm -hmm suddenly everybody took him seriously. And, right, and, right. Yeah, and of course it was, I mean, good luck played a big role, but one thing that emerges from the letters that he has written during that time is, um, you know, how easy it all came to him because, uh, because, and I'm sure that must have annoyed some of his fellow students who had to work very hard to, to achieve half of what he did. But as you know, in, in, in his biography of Feynman, James Glick has Freeman reading a newspaper until late afternoon and then somehow getting into a, a calculation or another and then again taking time off for tea and then taking the evening off so i mean it, it seems like he had a lot of fun doing it. it 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 was very hectic in one sense but it was also a lot of fun in in another yeah he just sort of worked in bursts i mean he would he would solve a problem in the back of his mind then work very hard for days writing it into a paper but but that was it and then it was over he moved on to the I mean, you know, I, I usually, if I'm going to do an interview, I, pre I do a lot of preparation. I did no preparation, but I did, I did print out, uh, I put his complete bibliography together for the Royal Society. And it's, yeah. it's actually, it, it's 489 references. I mean, so, it, you know, with a certain amount of duplication where there'd be th two or three versions of the same result for different journals, but most of it, and and book reviews and things, but he just had this ability to to write um, to produce a finished product in in a single draft. He just would sit down, write the paper, send it off, and yeah, and, yeah, you know, maybe a few corrections. But um, it's it's what uh, reminds me of what Marina von Neumann used to say about John von Neumann. He he wrote first last drafts first. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's basically it. but but for those who are watching uh george's obituary for freeman in the royal society is highly recommended of all the obituaries that have been written that's the most detailed and comprehensive so even if you don't read anything else about freeman make sure to read what george has written but uh, and it's got um, great photos too and it's got great photos which you're not going to find elsewhere that's right so um yeah, so of course, then you know, there's there's his famous work with Feynman and friendship with Feynman, and in many ways that his friendship with Feynman, I mean, it's one of the most amusing parts of his life because this seems to be a meeting, in some sense, a meeting of minds, but in in another sense, a meeting of opposites. I mean, you know, one one is this very dignified, reserved, you know, British graduate students, and the other one is this uh, very flamboyant uh, New Yorker from far Rockaway. Uh, and you know, I it, it's it's just how 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 did they hit it off? I I always find that relationship very interesting. Well, it is that as you say, it's the opposites. I mean, the, the, Friedman was absolutely as so many of those Europeans who came to America, they fell in love with America, and they wanted to meet Americans. And as a physicist, it's not that easy to meet, you know, because you're like at Los Alamos, you were put in a group of. Hungarians and Viennese and so on, and, and there were very few Americans at Los Alamos, or, or not, you know. Native, Native or, ball, yeah. Yeah. So Feynman was, you know, from far Rockaway, from Long Island, and didn't try and hide it at all. I mean, he, right. he yeah. wore a t-shirt, and, and, and of course, Freeman was just in love with that, and 
and Feynman realized that that I think, I think first Feynman was quite suspicious of Freeman. What, what's he going to do with my, you know, he's not a genius like me, but, but it was clear they could work together and that, that Freeman succeeded in, in, in sort of making sense out of, out of some of Feynman's ideas. And they, they did become friends uh, the same way Freeman became friends, very close friends later with Ted Taylor, who was also American, I mean, born in Mexico city, but raised uh, raising and I think I mean to me in a certain way Feynman might be partly why I'm here I mean in the sense that that I think I mean of course Freeman coming from that absolutely segregated British prep school world no real exposure to women and, and whereas Feynman had a had a real knack you know probably to to a fault with women but I'm sure he, he must have explained that to to Freeman. I mean, Freeman must have said, "Oh, there's this beautiful Swiss mathematician. What do you right. know, what do I do?" And he he, he said, "Well, here, you know, Doctor <laughs> here, Freeman. This is what you do. You know, ask her out or 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 whatever." Um, yeah, that's I mean, right. Someone friend of mine asked. Yeah, yeah. Mentioned names. Asked Feynman. You know, what's your what's your trick with what's this trick with women you have? And he said, oh, I, I just ask. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think he says that in, in his memoirs, but yeah, so clearly, I mean, in, in many ways, you're, you're right. That the, the, this period of Freeman's life was the most important thing was meeting your mother. And, um, and um, this was when he was at Cornell and what was she, she was a, she was a graduate student as well. Uh, oh no, no, sorry. He, oh, he they, met... they didn't, they didn't meet till the Institute. Till he, oh, till the Institute. he met her in, at, in the Princeton. At, yeah, in, in right. late nineteen forty-eight, when they came, right, they right. ended up at, at IAS. Okay, so, yeah. So let's let's backtrack a bit. I mean, you know, he clearly his great work, best known work, was unifying these theories of uh, Julian Schwinger and and Feynman, and and and, uh, and, and oh and and Tomonaga, right? And you know that that was an amazing piece of work. Uh, some people think that it was. A set of mathematical tricks, but I think a lot of people don't recognize this. And uh, David Kaiser, who has written that book about Feynman diagrams, he makes it very clear that it wasn't just unifying those theories, which sounds like a very abstract thing to do, but it was really developing practical tools, mathematical tools that people could apply in in the real world to real world problems. And and that's just something that needs to be emphasized because. You know, even today I hear some people saying, well, you know, Feynman and Schwinger, they developed those theories. He he just unified them. I mean, you know, that first of all, that makes unification sound like a trivial thing to do, which it was not. It was ex exceedingly hard. Neither of them could do it. it. It took Freeman to do it. But he also gave these very practical tools to the community at large that then spread throughout the community. And um, was Feynman, I mean, there's a part in maybe not, Dave Kaiser's book, but there was no sort of jealousy on Feynman's side because that that people were using tools that were developed by Freeman and applied by Freeman, right? They, they, there was never that kind of a problem. Uh, I don't know. I don't think, you know, yeah, yeah. what's... It, I mean, Freeman, he never, to me, said a bad word about anyone. I mean, he, he was right, so... Yes. <laughs> um, he, and, and it... I don't. I don't think it was good for me. I grew up with this very naive view of academia. I mean, I didn't. I didn't go to college. I didn't. Go, but I just thought they all lived together happily and worked. Yeah, it was a. It was a utopia. Everyone was an yeah, angel. The benefit of science and physics. I mean, Freeman made it just seem so, so peaceful. And 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 then I. I just as you did. I just read Bill Press's autobiography, and he <laughs> gives all the. <laughs> you know, all the parts. He, he details all the feuds and how everybody was stabbing each other in the back. And, <laughs> and he, it's remarkable. I can't believe he published that thing while people are still alive, but, but it, <laughs> it gives a very different picture. So, so I don't know what, you know, I certainly never heard any gossip from Freeman that, that, that Feynman didn't, but you know, but they, they kept their distance in a way. You know, the, I mean, the only person I knew Freeman had some sort of, rivalry with was murray gelman I mean, just just <laughs> they really didn't like each other but but he, he wouldn't be the only one as you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. gelman was was a brilliant but prickly 
physicist. He had uh, interesting relationships with with a lot of people. Um, yeah, but so you know, instead of talking about everything scientific that Freeman did, of which there's a lot, and you know, a finite amount of time, I think this is a good opportunity to talk, to talk about Freeman's view of establishment institutions, which I think is very interesting because some people would think that he worked at the ultimate establishment institution, uh, which uh, institute in Princeton, but he didn't really have that view. He was very, very anti-establishment in, in many ways, um, not the least of which was his animosity towards the, the PhD as, as a degree, uh, which which I think is, is well known to a lot of people. He said that it really sucks away four or five years of people's lives. It forces uh, the professor to work on just one problem. So it's very bad for what he called frogs and, and instead of birds. And, and it's especially bad for women who might want to start families in their late 20s and so on. And so, you know, in, in many ways, what I find fascinating is that uh, the, the Institute at Princeton gave him great opportunities, um, uh, unprecedented, but he somehow still thought that Cornell was was the better place. It was more American and it was much a much friendlier and more conducive place to work at. Yes. I mean, you're, what you say about the PhD, what's important is to slightly qualify that, that he, he didn't think the PhD itself was bad. Yeah. What he objected to was that it had become a requirement, right? That right. He, he always said that, you know, the PhD makes sense for a certain small number of people who who it it things but then then it would become this sort of universal requirement where you cannot teach at a university without a phd that 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 was what was wrong the same as he that was also his objection to string theory that that he had nothing against string theory right yeah. but everybody shouldn't all physicists should not have to be string theorists when you, you'd ask him people were always trying to sort of journalists were you know we were trying to push him into saying something about string they say you know mr dyson what do you think about string theory he was also very careful not to criticize but he would say well how many string theorists are there and and the answer depending on the year you know would be well there's there's ten thousand there's a hundred thousand too many <laughs> and he'd say well i, I think one thousand would be enough and that's right. I think what he would say about PhDs is what, you yeah, know, a thousand absolutely. PhDs in the world is probably sufficient. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of it was also geared towards the the, the snobbishness that sometimes comes with, with getting a PhD for some people. And I think the, you know, that is something I always loved about Freeman's viewpoint and his writings is that that snobbishness sometimes does, uh, it, it it's very unfair to technicians and inventors and, and people, engineers. Who, yeah, and engineers in general. That's right. Many of whom don't have PhDs, uh, whether in academia or industry. And and so I thought, in, in many ways, that was one of the most valuable contributions that I always thought Freeman went, F Freeman made to to the discourse around science and technology. That much more importance needs to be given to inventors. As you know, one of his favorite people in the history of science was this one-armed astronomer Bernard Schmidt from Germany, who built and designed the Schmidt telescope. And not not much formal education, and you know, blew off his arm in a, in, a, in an explosion. But I mean, the Schmidt telescope if effectively improved the the efficiency of surveying the sky by tenfold or twentyfold, effectively, and made it cheaper by tenfold. Oh. He's very strong about that. And, the, and, the, and then there's this problem again, you know, like, like where you're tainted. If you you can be a very good scientist, but if you do any engineering, you are now. <laughs> Painted as a scientist, like there's sort of there's prejudice against people who 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 can do both. Yeah, it's it's certainly been been my experience. I mean, I worked in industry, not academia, most of my career, and uh, the the best people that I I know in most of the places that I work, the companies have been technicians without PhDs. They just have bachelor's degrees, but they know everything inside out. A lot of times you know the phds and you know i have a phd so i'm guilty of it myself uh, we can we can kind of sit on top and not really understand all the details and and claim that we do understand them which which we don't always the the technicians are much better at that i always thought that if 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 there was ever a prize that could be awarded in freeman's name it should go to non phd inventors and engineers right uh, 
there's enough prizes for PhD scientists around. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's move on to kind of the second part of Freeman's career, right? Which is he made all these great contributions, too many to be discussed in in a single session to physics, mathematics, who, uh, and then worked on some very practical engineering problems. So speaking of engineers, and probably the two most prominent were Project Orion, which was the spaceship, nuclear spaceship, and uh, and, and Triga, which was the safe reactor. And um, what I find interesting is that Freeman, I mean, of, of course, he had a mind that could grasp new ideas very quickly, but he had no practical engineering experience before he really worked on on the reactor or the or the spaceship, right? I mean, discounting what he had learned during World War II at Bomber Command, I'm sure he learned some engineering principles there. But how was that? How was that transition for him, uh, working on these very practical engineering problems? He just took to a you know like a duck to water. I mean, I, I, I remember Ted Taylor told me that one day, you know, when he hired Freeman, Freeman said that. You know, I could be a very good physicist. I know I could be a good physicist, but I want to be the best engineer ever. I mean, he he at that time when when it looked like the project was going to get the green light from the government, he he was completely prepared to to make as big a switch from physics to engineering as he had made from number theory to to physics, and and I mean to complete the story that he you know he he did that resolution of the Feynman Swinger Tomonaga thing and built that system that was so good at numerical predictions. And but he wanted to extend that into a much bigger system that would go to much higher orders. And that that failed. I mean again the story of Freeman's life is a lot of failures. And so he had this grand program. And when that failed he was left you know a little bit adrift. I mean in the sense that what am I going to do now? And that's, I think, when he when he decided more that he's going to work with a shorter attention span on 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 smaller problems, not try and solve all the problems of physics in one system. Right. right. And and Triga just was a summer job. I mean, it just was it again it came out of the sort of Cornell Mafia. One of Beta's grad students from Los Alamos was Freddie de Hoffman, who who mm. became an entrepreneur. So let's let's go into when. Atomic energy was declassified to some degree. He said, "Let we're going to start a company to do fusion energy. That was what General Atomic was going to do, as as we still are trying to do today." And Freeman desperately wanted to work on fusion energy that because he saw as the physicist that was the the answer. But being still then a British citizen, he he was fusion was not. It's interesting that fission was declassified, but fusion was fusion not. Was so fusion was because of the hydrogen bomb. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't go near the fusion stuff. So again, to keep him busy, because he'd been hired for the summer, he said, well, you help help Edward Teller design this safe reactor. And, and Freeman had, a again, a, just a, a big, it's his only patent. He's got his name on that patent mm. for a inherently safe nuclear reactor. There's still, they, they built <laughs> 72 of them, and there's still dozens Right, uh, running today, and and I think I think he said that 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 is still the only reactor that has actually made a profit for the company. That, yeah, that profitable. And it, it's what <laughs> again I think sort of made him a little bit irritated that why do we keep building these, you know, arguing about nuclear energy? Like, look, we we designed the safe reactor in 1956. Right. Or, yeah, a long time ago. Um, why don't why don't we? You know, it's it's not was not a power reactor, but the lessons learned could be used to. It's yeah, um, yeah. I mean, not not to digress, but in, in I remember a conversation I had with him where we talked about the fact that the big problem with nuclear power and nuclear energy is that there's there's no process of Darwinian selection that yeah. operates in other technological sectors. I mean, if you look at the history of computers, of course, there were so many competing designs, many of which did not work and went out of business. But n nuclear reactors, I mean, it kind of got stuck on one or two major designs. And nobody really played around with a lot lot, lot of other designs like Triga. No, and they did it in a, it's, you know, in this old schoolhouse in San Diego with a group of about <laughs> 20 people. So in, in one summer. So. Yes, yeah, that, that was very incredible. 
they had a working reactor in Geneva two years later. Right. So, yeah. 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 No, that's that's a good lesson for for you know people who want to keep investing in that technology. Uh, but you know, one thing I want to note is one of Freeman's qualities, which we I think all appreciated, was was his brutal honesty about not just science science, but about himself. And that thing you mentioned about him having a little bit of a crisis of confidence about his uh, abilities as a physicist, you know this, but for the people who are watching, um, in large part, or at least in some part, that was the result, a result of meeting with Enrico Fermi in, in Chicago, where he was working on some calculations and he thought he had gotten a good fit with experimental data. And Fermi effectively demolished his, his argument in a few minutes saying that that's not good enough. Just because you have a good fit with experimental data, that doesn't mean you have got a good theory or a good model or a good understanding of nature. And so, you know, I, I get the feeling, I mean, in fact, I think he said this to me that that's, that was a moment of realization for him that he's never gonna be as great a physicist as Fermi, but he could really focus on problems where mathematics makes a big difference and pick those problems very judiciously. So I always thought that quite apart from the fact that it there's the lesson about being brutally honest with yourself, but there's also the valuable lesson about picking the right problems. Um, you know, as, as Hans Bader once said, pick problems for which you possess an unfair advantage. And I think uh, Freeman certainly did, did that a lot in his career. Yes, I think it's also why he never had students again. I mean, at that time he was on the, he had, graduate students who who you were supposed to give them a problem they could work on for two years and he had they were working with him on this problem and suddenly it was deflated and he mm. he felt i think this terrible sense of responsibility that these poor people's careers are being you know disengaged because i picked the wrong problem that's you know that i i was wrong and he didn't want mm -hmm. that responsibility i think it's one reason he was much happier at the institute where where the young people effectively come for six months, so right, they're, yeah, they're not they're they're not doing a two year PhD. They're doing a, or four year PhD. They're yeah, they're yeah. just working I on think, something. Yeah, that's that's certainly a level of honesty that I wish we would see more in 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 professors in in academia today, where you know they will recruit these armies of graduate students and just have them work on problems irrespective of what what the problems are going to look like one or two years from now. Um, so that so he works on Triga, he works on Project Orion. Those are the big engineering things. And now, you know, we're talking roughly about the 70s. And so, you know, now I want to talk a bit about the second big half of his career, where, you know, he kept on working on science problems, but he moved much more into science policy and then writing. And what is interesting to me is that um, Disturbing the Universe, which was the first popular book that he read, uh, that, that he wrote, and which I believe is still his his best book. I mean, all of them are worth reading. Uh, but he wrote that when he was, what, 50 or 55? 55, 55 yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, he started in his 50s. It was the first book that the Sloan Foundation published. They they decided to, let's try and get scientists to write literary books. And their first test case was Freeman. And they right, were right. And and Ulam's, Ulam's autobiography is from the same series, right? I think. I th Think so. I think it, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't think it's yeah, I, Okay. Okay. Maybe maybe something else. Then. Oh, maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking about uh, Mark Mark Cotts, the, yeah, the edition, that, that, Enig Enigmas of Chance. I think that's that's from the same series. That was a very great program. Now they kind of switched to films, not books. But oh, okay. I I didn't know that because I know Bill Press says that those are the ones that he used to enjoy reading, and then they stopped doing that, which was a pity. Um. So I think it's, you know, until the 70s, I'm, you know, Freeman used to write a little bit for Scientific American. I know he wrote a few articles for Scientific American, but he was not really known to the, the world at large. He was not really known as, as a public intellectual or public writer. So I'm assuming all that started happening after Disturbing the Universe came out. and the, the... No, it, it happened before. And it's really, it's important to give credit where credit is due. The, the credit really goes to Jeremy Bernstein. Oh, I see. Okay. Who, you know, was a physicist right. who is still alive. He's one of the yes. only people. So he was at General Atomic with Freeman. And Jeremy became the first 
science correspondent for the New Yorker, which was a very groundbreaking thing for the New Yorker, which was this very high class. New right, Yorker. right. Yeah. To bring in someone to write about science for the popular. So Jeremy wrote long series of profiles of scientists and and so Jeremy very generously sort of brought Freeman into the fold. I mean, I think told them like, you know, I have a scientist friend who's not entirely bad as a writer and because he wrote <laughs> these great general atomic reports. So that that's how Freeman became a writer was the New Yorker. Oh, and so his first piece was actually about the. Um, it was a, about a visit, visit to Russia or one of the Eastern European countries? I to yeah he went to write that he wrote for the um baltimore sun that much okay. early but at the new yorker he he wrote he wrote what became disturbing the universe that was published in pieces but he also wrote about a visit to armenia which was a conference on communication with extraterrestrial intelligence so he's he started writing these pieces for the new yorker which were which were absolutely brilliant right right and yeah. and then you know, after disturbing the universe, I mean, a lot of the books that he wrote, they were based on talks that he gave. So lectures, you know, infinite in all directions that came out in the 80s. That was based on uh, the Gifford lectures in, in Scotland. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, and several other books were also based on lectures. But one book that stands out for me from the 80s, and we should talk a little bit about that, was Weapons and Hope, yeah. uh, which is a very interesting book. It's really a, a book about not just military strategy, but military hardware written by a humanist, which I think places it in a special category. I, I don't think I have read a lot of books about military hardware or about defense issues written from that viewpoint. Yeah, no, it, it's a, a brilliant book. and it, it arose out of his being, being brought into the sort of corridors of government as he had talked about in that complaint in 1952 mm. the, the american government was trying to listen to scientists at least in some areas and and so he he testified to congress about the test ban treaty and various things like that and then so he had this deep technical knowledge of nuclear weapons from getting his clearance and, and being involved in jason and stuff so that book it's what's interesting is that he he wrote that book and both sides loved it the the strongest Hawks and the or Helen Caldicott nuclear right, yeah. the, activists the, they the, loved that book because it it showed the the military futility of of using these weapons and the the hardest of the uh, warriors loved the book too because it explained what they were doing in a, in, a, in a technically true in a way they respected you know it did, and. And yeah, so he he really he 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 really gained the he had the respect of the sun on that issue, which of course yeah, didn't which have. was <laughs> yeah, which in the eighties especially under the you know with the arms buildup under Reagan must have been a very difficult thing to pull off since <laughs> things were pretty polarized, especially in Reagan's first term. Yeah, I remember in that book he says at one point, my goal is to make peace between Helen and the generals, and yes. <laughs> uh, he did succeed in doing that, which is quite remarkable. Um, and so let's talk about Jason a bit because he had been consulting on Jason since what's the the sixties or or seventies, beginning really. I mean, Jason, really even even earlier. Um, well, nineteen sixty actually. They they were running a couple years. The first couple summers he didn't participate. I think primarily because he was the physicists do a lot in the summer. There are these summer schools like in like Cecile Dewitt's school in France, and the you know the. So, so he was sort of booked up with these summer physics, and then, then the, I think the third year, nineteen sixty, he he started doing the summers with Jason. Hmm. And the special sort of special sauce, if you will, that he brought to Jason was a his understanding of mathematics and ability to apply mathematics to practical problems. Um, is that what what do you think was was the main ingredient that made him so valuable? Um, or, yes, the mathematical, the ability to sort of jump into anything. I mean, they were doing, we still don't know half the stuff they were doing. It was right. still classified. It's interesting. When I, when I went to his office three days after he died to sort of, 
two things were at the top of his desk. One was a, a manuscript calculation for Bill Press on on some sort of genetic evolution question. Mm. And the other was, a, and I um, kind of turned it over. I mean, it was a list of the topics for Jason that year, which are, which are most of them secret. So it was right. Yes. Yeah. Noted that what the, what the studies were going to be. Some yeah. of them quite, they can be quite chilling because they, it, the way though, it's the Dr. Strangelove thing. They, you know, they <laughs> like to put a very, you had to work on some sort of revealing yeah. code name on, on uh, what, you know what problems the government is concerned about and but he just kept at it you know, for, for 50 years and they they looked at it was amazing the variety of things they of course a lot of underwater sound finding submarines and then yeah. adaptive yeah. optics which became became like schmidt just sort of revolutionized astronomy uh, right and, and i mean i remember that once when we met he he told me that they had worked on the census problem for jason and I mean, you know, the census problem to most people will sound like the most boring problem that anyone can work on, but it's in both enormously interesting and of course, enormously important not yeah. to have that information leak out. So, you know, that gives you a sense of what they what they did there. Yeah, yeah they worked on the war of drugs one summer. And, right, uh, right. Another another very important underappreciated. <laughs> solved it in three days, but the, but the same thing that the, the powers that be didn't want to hear the solutions. So. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, I, I want to spend the, the rest of the time, um, not too much time, but, but, but I want to focus on, on a signature quality that, that Freeman had. And I think you, you talked about the last manuscript that he was working on, which was some theory of evolution. I mean, to the public at large, largely based on that 2010 uh, New York Times profile, Freeman was always known as a contrarian, right? Everyone thought of him as that, and he certainly was. I, you know, there's there's no doubt about it. But um, but I think the 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 word that he liked better was rebel, and and you know his one of his essay collections is called the scientist as rebel. And did he think of himself as as a contrarian? Is is that something that he did deliberately? Yeah, I think he was pretty deliberate. I mean, he always would argue the other side, hmm. whatever the side was. You know, whenever there was a question of science, he he he, you know, and of course favored the underdog, which which I, I like. But yes, he, he just and, and of course the more important thing is to is to understand that Freeman and you know this, but Fr Freeman was a very firm believer in complementarity. The fact that that two opposing things can be both be true at the same time and, and that was his resolution i mean the current crisis in physics where we're trying to resolve um you know relativity and quantum mechanics freeman's view is well why why do you have to resolve them why can't these two things these two theories can both be true they don't have to be pushed into one and he felt that about about human issues as well that both of course the situation in the mid-east too i mean both sides both sides have a truthful view it's it's in conflict but um so so in that sense the, the contrarian he was always arguing for the side that wasn't an example being climate change when, where he started out arguing very strongly in favor of of raising the alarm about climate change and then when when everybody started raising the alarm he said he went switched and said well don't be so alarmed and Right. I remember when when I was a young, I think sixth grade, we had a, there was this thing where they they had mock United Nations assemblies in the school. It was it was a, probably a program funded by the State Department or something, and, and we all had to take a part. And he, and I got the role of Guatemala, and and he persuaded me to go in and argue against the United Fruit Company and you know basically take the communist position. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and I was destroyed by the I mean, right. Most people would not have agreed with you, I'm assuming. <laughs> and uh, but I naively went in, you know, you know, my dad told me to, you know, make this argument. It was not the argument to make. Yeah. Yeah. And I I, you know, in many ways, I I deeply, deeply appreciated that that viewpoint that he had because 
you know, it's the contrary argument, even if it has a small probability of being true sometimes, not always, but sometimes it has a pretty small probability of being true. The very fact that it's contrary means that it has a chance to append conventional wisdom. And that's essentially how science progresses. That's how you get scientific revolution. So I thought it was very important. But, you know, what I did just, just for our amusement, I, I made a very short list of some of the contrarian things that, that he said. So, of course, you know, his contrarian thinking about climate change was well known. Most of the public uh, knows him for that. I think it was misrepresented in a lot of public forums. He was never as zealous about it as people thought. Uh, he was actually pretty moderate. But some of the other things include science and religion. Uh, he always thought that there could be, you know, they could be on friendly terms with each other. There need not be any opposition. Uh, he very strongly disagreed with Richard Dawkins's view of religion, for instance, and, you know, respected him as a scientist, obviously. Um, another thing um, was that he definitely was against thinking of science as, as just being any, any one kind of thing, as a rule-based system that fits within a certain box, uh, you know, within a certain philosophy. And, um, uh, you know, his, his philosophy was very close to the philosophy of, um, uh, uh, Paul Fairbend, the philosopher of science, who basically said, "Well, science is an anarch, you know, it's it's all it's anarchy. It's a chaotic enterprise. There's no one way of doing science." And Freeman was, I think, quite sympathetic to that viewpoint, which I always liked. Uh, we already talked about his um, uh, thinking about the academic system, you know, the establishment versus inventors. But I always thought that even when it came to relatively minor things, they kind of always jumped out at you and, and told you how he would think differently from the other side. So in one of his letters, which he is writing to his parents, this is right after JFK's assassination. And of course, it was a big tragedy. You know, the country was, entire country was talking about that. And you probably remember this, but in the letter that he writes shortly after that, he says, well, you know, I feel sorry about JFK and what happened to him and his family, but I feel even more sorry about Medgar Evers, the African-American activist who was killed by a white supremacist around the same time. And, you know, to me, that is very striking because most people, you know, the two events would not have been comparable, right? JFK is this very great event, world changing, but somehow Freeman realized that in some sense, Medgar Evers's assassination is more important because it's the assassination of a civil rights activist who could have done a lot of lot of things differently had he lived. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. And then the other day, I think uh, I posted this on Twitter and some people got annoyed about it, but I thought that was classic Freeman. He's talking about Pearl Harbor because two, two years back, uh, two, two days back was December 7th, right? And he says, well, Pearl Harbor to me is an example of the Japanese emphasis on beauty. <laughs> and, you know, of course, that got people worked up. But he said, well, if you think about it, tactically, it was a very beautiful thing. It was very well executed. Strategically, it made no sense whatsoever. But that's very much in keeping in line with the Japanese way of thinking, where they don't always think about the strategic utility. They just think about whether something is beautiful. And to me, that really encapsulates the way Freeman thought. He would just look at the other side and honor these little gems of, of contrary wisdom. But I'm sure you have you must have more to add based on what you remember. Yeah, it was sort of everywhere. I mean, it, it came down to everything. He always looked at looked at everything different. I mean, the, the problem there, it's, a, it's a good or bad. It has, you know, he sort of then became patron saint to people with crazy ideas. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that, like or, yeah, any anyone who opposes the establishment then then becomes the darling of uh, conspiracy theorists and far, far, you know, extremists. That's always the problem. Yeah, so it's 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 odd how he... Um, I mean, that, and, and that unfortunately happened with climate change where, you know, some of the outright deniers, the people who don't even believe in climate change or global warming, they embraced him as, as kind of an icon of their movement, which he absolutely was not. But no. uh, that did happen. You can always tell, I mean, you know, what he's talking quoted half the time he quoted as, as Nobel Prize winner Freeman Dyson. So <laughs> you know they have their facts wrong. To, to yeah, start. that's right. 
and and you remember this, but for our viewers, uh, he always used to joke about, I think he used to quote Jocelyn Bell, who also did not get a Nobel, but deserved it. He said, it's better if people ask me why I did not get it than why I did get it, which I thought was a very, very funny and, uh, you know, sort of very gracious take on the fact that he did not get it. Um, yeah, one of the last things he said in the in the hospital days before he died was no memorial service. <laughs> and and he got you know he got his wish because then he died right at the beginning of the covid right right so there was not a chance so there, there was the institute did schedule a memorial service which was canceled so right right yeah yeah so he did get his wish inadvertently um so the you know the last thing i wanted to talk about is because we said that we could kind of divide this up into uh, first 100 and the next 100 and you know we don't have to spend a whole lot of time but he was, of, of course, also known as a futurist, and he came up with some very interesting ideas. And, uh, you know, he once, as you know, said, I would rather be wrong than be vague. And so he was always very clear about what he thought, which I thought was a great lesson uh, to take away from him. Because if you're clear, then what you're saying can be falsified more easily. But if you're vague, then it's all over the place and almost anything goes right. But, uh, you know, I also, I also have a short list of things that he thought would come true in the future. And some of them are very exciting, of course. He had this piece in the New Yorker about what we can call the domestication of biotechnology, which is very exciting. You know, he he, he thought that biotechnology would go down the same, same road as computer technology did. And just like computers were miniaturized and became cheap and anyone could start using a computer and assembling it, people would start assembling uh, genetically engineered uh, organisms and you know he had this very nice description of how young kids would be able to build their own insect eating plant or build their own dinosaur maybe in the future and i thought that was just such a charming and fascinating vision and and of course there's technical challenges there there's also moral and ethical questions uh, but i personally think that there was something to it i think uh, it's certainly become becoming more accessible um and you know what are your thoughts uh, well, yeah, he, I mean, he also, the other thing he always said was it's the purpose of talking about the future is not to predict it, but to give people hope. So, right. Yes. He, he was looking, I mean, he had done more than his share of work on the downside of genetic engineering of what the, right. what the problems could be. So there he was looking at what, you know, what are the hopeful things and, so I, we clearly are on that path. I mean, now you can get, you know, you can get stuff sequenced and synthesized for for absolutely trivial amounts of money. It's 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 it, what he what he predicted there is is clearly happening. I think some of his other predictions are more far, you know, more far fetched. We we may or may not get there. Um, yeah, but. and. What about space travel? Because clearly that was something he wrote very extensively about. What do you What do you think about, for instance, Blue Origin and SpaceX's efforts? Oh, he, he was absolutely right. I mean, there's a case where um, I have to, you know, I work for Blue Origin, so I right there twenty years now. I, I when it I was the only person left from the beginning besides the founder, but but I I wrote a memo about I. I'll either get fired for this or else. I was very much a Freeman style. Six, there's a six page limit on memo. So I wrote this six page memo about, you know, how we got where we are and where we should be going. And, and many of Freeman's ideas are still there. I mean, he, 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 he strongly believed we needed small, cheap launch vehicles, not these enormous rockets that, that use, you know, a hundred tons of fuel to get, a small satellite and just just use lasers and send up the satellites with a little bit of water it's just such a such low-hanging fruit that we haven't done yet that he thought we would have be doing by now um so so he was in he was in favor of reusable rockets for instance well of, of basically no of, of, of keeping the energy source on the ground so separate the fuel there's this sort of people assume this sort of God-given assumption that we, that the, your fuel has to be your propellant. That's the way rockets work. You, you light the chemical and that, you know, you get reaction mass, but 
why not have the energy source separate from this? So th actually, Alcorth of his work on adaptive optics, he technically did very, and, and for a long time, still classified calculations on how how efficiently you can keep a laser beam collimated through the atmosphere. And you can, the same reason you can do adaptive optics to uh, get an image of a star that doesn't waver around, you can do the right. reverse and, and send up a beam. And you can use that beam to, so your, your rocket, your vessel just carries water as propellant and, and rides up this beam. Oh, I see. You, know, you, you could launch your 5,000 star only satellites over a couple of weeks if you if you build such a system why not do it and it's it's it's, just, it's obvious we should be doing that but we for some reason we're still stuck on chemical rockets and heat. that is that is fascinating yeah it's it's keeping the laser coherent and not allow it to destroy yeah, he wrote a, a, one of his jason studies from 1976 was on laser propulsion just definitely worth rereading um it's uh he also, there was also a Jason report on, on space infrastructure for the year 2020, written in the year 2000. It's, the needle hasn't moved much. Right, right. I was thinking of Jared, Jared O'Neill when you said that. We but went, yeah, but you know, some of the other things, of course, as, as you know, you know, his his thinking about the origin of life was was very interesting. And one thing that stuck out for me, and as you know, one of his interviews with Sam Schweber, Schweber asked him, um, what would we be your biggest contribution? And of course, the first thing he says, well, we are not going to know until I have been dead for a hundred years because these things are only just in, in, in hindsight. But he said that you thought that his yeah. work on the origin of life would be the, the most important. I thought so. But I mean, it's of course, as you know, it's the it's this dividing the dual origin. So there's an origin in metabolism and there's an origin in replication. And those are two different things. Right. I think it's a fundamentally, that's sort of a Darwinian separation of makes it, and the implication is of course it, it it makes the original life much more likely correct and much easier to do and then of course the the result the import the freeman dyson thing is that that is is more evidence that the universe is probably full of life and because you can develop a metabolism it doesn't have to be our, like our metabolism and, you, and then you can develop replication and those two things can develop independently and and probably translate mediums which is if, so Freeman's one of his predictions one of his most concrete predictions was he he was willing to bet that the first when we finally discover alien life it will not be on a planet it will be on something else and he he was willing to put his money on that I mean, I, you mean an asteroid or a comet, something yes, other than comet, a... something not. The assumption is we're going to find life. If we find life, we should be looking for life on planets. And he said, no, we should be looking for life on all the other things that yeah, are floating. Yeah. And he also wrote these these very interesting, amusing pieces about trees growing on asteroids and planets. And, uh, you know, that those could be sources, certainly. So, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think it. what would be a good note to end on is uh, kind of the, you know, if you had to think about one lesson that you would carry from Freeman, I mean, I can I can start. I I think, you know, of all the great qualities that, that one could learn from, you know, emulate of Freeman's or lessons that you could learn from him, I think his undying optimism was one that was pretty apparent to a lot of us who knew him well. And of course, in these times, you know, we certainly need that optimism. Um, and and of course, he used to say that um, it was in large part because he grew up during the Second World War when times were so dark. So almost any other time sounds much better. But I think he also had this fundamental optimism um, in technology as as being not just useful, but also humane and in kind of leveling the playing field. And um, I think that's different from the techno optimism that you find in Silicon Valley, which is often just based in in hype. Um, but that the the kind of technological optimism that that Freeman had, I think, was very real, and that's that's a lesson that I think is is quite enduring, at least at least for me. Yes, I mean, he grew up in a childhood where people had to carry coal into their houses to heat, <laughs> heat their houses in London. In London, you know, people had to carry coal around. So he, yeah, he, he saw it get better. And then he, I mean, I'll leave you with one thing he told me at the, towards the end of his life. You know, Ted Taylor was a fanatic about that that we had only explored a 
a tiny fraction of the morphological space of possible nuclear weapons that there were that that he kept waking up at night thinking of new and freeman used to say that 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 ted's sort of going crazy that's not true and then late right towards the end of his life he said you know george the um ted taylor was right hmm. i woke up last night and i invented a new kind of nuclear weapon that that would change the world for the worse and I'm taking it to the grave with me. That that so, was a wise wise thing to do, definitely. <laughs> so that's, that's what we can thank him for. Yes, definitely. Well, on that note, um, I want to really thank you for your time, George. This this was a great conversation. I think all of us were were deeply touched by by Freeman, and I think uh, you know I I always think of him the way Danny Hillis thought about Feynman, right? That conversation where. Feynman said, "Well, I'm not. I'm not really going to go away because there's so much of me around. I have spread myself around, and that's that's very much the way I, I think about Freeman. So we'll we'll all keep, we'll all keep learning. He'll he'll always be there to to keep yeah. on teaching us. So. Thank you for keeping him. You're doing his more than anyone else for keeping his <laughs> his ideas alive. And if anyone listening wants some specific thing that he worked on, I I have a lot of his papers and the and all." The bulk of his papers have gone to the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, and they are being processed, and they're even now at the state where if you wanted his correspondence with a specific person or something, you, you, they're not open to the public, but but they are accessible, which is a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and yeah, if you're interested in any, any specifics, get in touch with George, and he'll, he'll be happy to help out. So, yeah. all right. Great. Thanks very much, George. Thank so, you. Have a good trip. Yep, you do. Hold on. 